Good evening. We welcome our guest, Kevin Nish from Victoria and Eva Bartlett from Toronto, I believe. <laughs> yeah, so we, let's we'll give them a hand and welcome them. I think it is important to commemorate the International Day of Solidarity because it, the, the date was infamous on the Palestinian calendar. The date represents the partition plan which was passed by the United Nations General Assembly to divide Palestine into two states. It's worth noting that the, in the people of Palestine, whether in uh, the uh, settler colonialist or the indigenous people of their land, they weren't consulted and there was no referendum to ask them what they want. The settler colonialists, we, we know what they wanted and they achieved what they wanted through the superpower manipulation and the superpower trying to pass this infamous uh, resolution. It was passed on uh, November 29th, 1947. And it's also worth noting that Canada played a major role in formulating and passing the United Nations uh, Partition Plan. Through Lester Pearson and Judge Rand, they played a major role to formulate and pass this infamous uh, resolution. To the point where the Zionists called Lester Pearson, who was, by the way, the Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, then he became the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, uh, the Canadian uh, Secretary for Foreign Affairs, and then, as most of you know, he became the Prime Minister. Maybe payoffs for what he did. But the Zionists called him the Belfour of Canada. And people know what Belfour is, who promised uh, Palestine, to, who promised the Zionist movement to establish a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. So it is important to note that because, you know, many people say here we are in Canada, we have nothing to do with these things that's happening in the halfway around the world, but really Canada carries a responsibility, moral and ethical responsibility for what happened to the Palestinian people. The ethnic cleansing that followed and the demolition of over 400 towns and villages uh, during 47, 48, when the Zionists took over not 56, percent of Palestine as the partition plan gave them, but took almost 80 percent, to be exact, 78 percent of historic Palestine. I just want to have a few quotes. Uh, uh, and before that, you know, the, it seems the, just to give a background about the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, the, the majority of members in the General Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, felt also guilty and responsible for what happened. So in 1967, in 1977, in 1977, they passed a resolution to commemorate what happened in 47, and they called it the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. So that's why we are here, not because we really uh, believe in the United Nations. Uh, they were the problem to start with, but it's symbolic gesture to show that the United Nations General Assembly admitting their guilt for what happened in 47. 
I, ra I like just uh, to have few quotes, bear with me, I won't be long. First, uh, from uh, M. S. Masoud, he was then the president of the Canadian Arab Friendship League in Montreal. And he was commenting on what happened in 47. He said, the Arab world would remember Lester B. Pearson and Justice Rand who did their utmost to impose upon the Arabs the infamous partition scheme. That's one. The other, during the debates at the UN uh, General Assembly, uh, Sir Zafrallah Khan, the representative of Pakistan to the UN, he said to the assembly in 1947, he said, empires rise and fall. We much fear that the beneficents, if any, to which partition may lead will be small in comparison to the mischief which it might inaugurate. That's what the representative of Pakistan said. And since both of them are Arabs or Muslims, let me quote you a secret report from the CIA on the partition plan. And this is the conclusion of the CIA report. If the UNG, this was just before the UNGA passed the resolution. The report says, and I'm quoting word by word, if the UNGA accepts partition as the best solution of the Palestinian problem, it is almost certain that armed hostilities will result in Palestine. That the social, economic, and political stability of the Arab world will be seriously disturbed. And the US commercial and strategic interest in the Near East will be dangerously jeopardized. That's from the CIA report. And then Mr. Bush, George W. Bush, he says why they hate us. After 60 years of what happened to the Palestinian, the injustices that been carried against the Arab world and specifically the Palestinian people, he's still wondering why they hate us. So I'm gonna uh, say one thing, that these injustices won't last for long. They lasted over 60 years, but the right is might. Might is not right. And what the US is doing and what their uh, puppet states all over the world doing, they're not gonna last long. The cliff is coming, whether it's economic or military, and they're gonna go over it, whether in in the US or in Israel. And I thank you. It is really important that we have people like Kevin and Eva here because they are witness to what's happening in uh, Israel, Palestine. They are eyewitness because the media and the governments here are trying to blind all the people in North America and in the world for what Israel is doing. And really, Israel is getting away with murder. So it's important to have eyewitnesses to tell us what's really happening. Uh, uh, Kevin went to Palestine many times. He was there during uh, the first attack uh, at Al Muqata'a and the reoccupying of so-called Area A by the Israeli military under the order of Sharon. And he, he uh, stayed there for a few months and then he went few times uh, again. And then lately he went, he emphasized on Gaza and he was one of the people, one of the survivors of the Mavi Marmara where 10 uh, aid workers were slaughtered in cold blood by the Israeli military in international water. Talk about pirates. That's what happened when uh, Kevin was at the Mavi Marmara. Ma uh, uh, Kevin 
uh, although they confiscated money, footage, uh, video footage and pictures, he succeeded in uh, exposing what happened because he smuggled some of the photos during the Mavi Marmara. Uh, and again, he just recently returned from Gaza where he served with the International Solidarity Movement in, in, in Gaza and in Palestine. Let's welcome Kevin. The mainstream media gives you the idea that the Palestine-Israel conflict is, is complicated. It's not complicated. I don't think it's complicated. It's, it's very simple. It's about a, an indigenous Palestinian people, as we see here, who love the land, and a group of people follow a, a Zionist policy who want to take the land from the indigenous people here. And, that, and that's, that's it in a nutshell. It's about land and the money and power that goes with land. And it's, it's as simple as that. Um, I mean, you can't... Um, you, you live there a while, be there a while, and you can see the people. They, 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 it, the, the land are the Palestinians. The Palestinians are the land. So this is a, uh, an ISM action that I was a part of. We were planting olive trees in February about um, 200 meters from the Israeli border. There should have been a safe zone as per the November um, ceasefire. But we planted these trees under the Israeli guns and they came across with a, uh, bulldozers within about a more about two or three weeks and plowed the whole mess up. But, um, but they'll replant it again and again and again. So can we switch over to the escape? There we go. Okay. Thank you. It ignored people. Uh, originally I said forgotten people on this slide and I realized they're not forgotten, they're ignored. Everybody knows about the Palestinians, but everyone is, is simply ignoring them. George Bush knows what the problem is. Netanyahu knows what the problem is. They all understand what the problem is. But the all, including Mr. Harper and, and the Western nations, simply ignore the Palestinians. So I'm just going to flash through damage. Um, Eva is going to be doing a lot more damage pictures. I'm, I'm just going to, a police station, Gaza, um, playground, uh, I think uh, uh, civic buildings, more civic buildings, university. A uh, downtown office building. A uh, rocket went right through from the top to the bottom of the part of the building to get to this Palestinian um, uh, government office on the bottom floor. Uh, disabled sports arena. I'm going to go through them quickly. I'm sorry, but it's a uh, disabled sports um, stadium. It got hit by a rocket, another rocket, another rocket, another rocket, another rocket, another one, another one. Um, one, of my, one of my jobs when I went there, I'm a mechanic, so when I went this last three months between June and September, I volunteered to, uh, to fix fire trucks. This is a fire truck. In 08, 09, the Israelis targeted every fire hall in Gaza, and this is the result. Uh, you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that was a fire truck, but it was. Um, hit by a rocket, destroyed. Um, many, many. There was actually a truck in the shop that they were repairing that had been damaged in 0809 era, and they were just getting it out the door when I was there. It was um, terrible. So, uh, wow, what can you say? Attacking fire trucks, ambulances. Um. Okay, this, this is uh, Mr. Nasser's family home near Kaza in the along the eastern border of, um, of Gaza, right there, about 200 meters from the Israeli border. Three years ago, um, out of the blue, the Israeli uh, army attacked his little farm. It's just sitting by itself uh, alone. You can't see any other neighbor near it, but they attacked his farm. And um, one of the kids was sitting out in the yard, a baby, and the mother ran out the door to retrieve the baby. And the, uh, an Israeli tank fired what's called a flechette shell. And what a flechette shell is, and ha Eva will talk about this more, it's a dart, it's full of darts, thousands of darts. One, one shell did all this damage. And, um, and she died right where the plant is, just at the lower right-hand corner here. And they planted the uh, 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 roses for her. Anyway, so uh, that, that's what a flechette shell does. It sends out thousands of darts. It's an anti-personnel weapon. It's, it's a war crime. You know, it, that, this is a war crime scene, basically. For someone to use such a weapon against civilians, um, I mean, that's what a flechette shell does to sheets of, you know, fairly heavy iron. 
and I've got one in my pocket here. Um, there, there's, uh, there's the shells, there, there's the uh, flechettes, and there's thousands of them in one shell, as you can see. And Evo will mention this, the, the, they're actually designed to break apart, and the fins break off after they enter somebody, so that they have a twin direct, uh, trajectory through the person, and it's harder to, to deal with it. Um, and these are hardened steel, as you can see, they went through. I mean, I tried to straighten one of these out with a pair of pliers, and you can't, because they're hardened steel. Um, it's a war crime. And this is uh, everybody who died in 0809, 1,400 people. And if you look close, you can see there's whole families with the same name all, all been wiped out. So um, I'm going to deal more with the people of Gaza. Eva is going to deal with a lot more of the um, disturbing pictures of um, uh, injured people and whatnot. While I was there, thankfully, there wasn't any incursion, serious incursions from the Israelis. They, they shot numerous farmers. They shot fishermen. They kidnapped fishermen. But there was no major attack, thankfully, so my, I, I didn't have to act as a human shield, um, as I've done before. So uh, this, this is the, uh, the weekly meeting at the Red Cross, where the uh, families of the detained and arrested Palestinians, their families meet to plead, plead the best way they can for the release of their loved ones. And this happens every week. It's been happening for years. So uh, I'll just... They're doing this so somebody on the outside can see it. So I'm going to show this, just a series of pictures of, of people that, that are there. Not much I can really say, just... We went every week, I went there every week for three months to see these people over and over and over again. Fishing boat captain. So while I was there, I entered through Rafa, through Egypt, and I entered in June 19th when Morsi was still in power. July 3rd, he was overthrown by a military dictatorship, and then there was uh, numerous massacres. Um, I don't know what you people saw, but... Um, Al Jazeera TV in, in Gaza. It was just a city stream of bodies and, and horrendous. So the Palestinians very much cared about what was happening in Egypt and, uh, and came out and, and demonstrated just to stop the bloodshed. This is a group of women marching uh, again to stop the bloodshed in Egypt. So I'll do a quick little rundown about the, um, the buffer zone, but again, Eva is going to deal with it more than me. This is a uh, remote-controlled, automated um, uh, gun tower. Eva will talk about it more. Eva's one is closed. This one's open and ready to fire. You can see the gun up on top. There's somebody probably in Tel Aviv at a computer watching me. Um, the gun's not aimed at me, thankfully, I don't think. But, uh, but this, this is, um, and, and it's ringed. Basically, all the way around Gaza, there's, there's these gun towers. I saw many, many of them. So when you speak about a buffer zone, uh, th this, this is an example of the buffer zone, shoot to kill buffer zone. This is in northern, northern Gaza, just, I guess, outside of Bet Hanun. So th this, is, this is the amount of land. You can see the fence, the Israeli fence, way off in the distance. This is the amount of land that the Palestinians lose because it's a shoot to kill buffer zone. Um, you can imagine, they need every scrap of land they can, but um, they lose all this and all the way around the, bu the buffer zone, all the way around the, uh, buff the uh, border between Israel and Gaza. Um, the November 2012 ceasefire between Hamas and Israel should have allowed the Palestinians to form within 100 meters of that fence all the way around. Uh, Israel more or less ignored that from the get-go. And, and, and after Morsi was overthrown, they completely ignored it. So uh, I, went, I went to a number of um, hospitals uh, just to bear witness of people being, who had been shot while they were near the buffer zone. One guy was shot a kilometer away from the buffer zone. Um, he was on, on a picnic with his family. Um, okay, the other part of the, uh, the struggle right now is the, the ocean, the, the fishing zone. Um, I believe Oslo should have allowed the fishermen to go to 20 miles. The Israelis, you know, shrunk that down to 12, and then to 6, and then to 3 miles. And while I was there, again, with the ceasefire agreement in November, it was moved out to 6 miles. 
But while I was there, again, once Morsi was overthrown, uh, they, were, they were grabbing Palestinian fishermen uh, one and a half kilometers from shore. While I was there, an Israeli gunboat cruised right in front of the port. Um, you could almost throw a rock at him. I think they, they were probably hoping somebody would shoot at, shoot at the ship so they could simply fire back. But he, you know, there, there is no, there, there's a ceasefire, but it's a one-way ceasefire. The, the Palestinians are desperately, desperately trying to keep the ceasefire going for what it's worth to the point that they wouldn't let me sail with the fishermen because they thought the fishermen would get emboldened with an internationalist on board and might go beyond the six mile limit. So they actually wouldn't let me sail with the fishermen except for this demonstration here. And the same thing with the farmers. They, they didn't want the farmers to break the ceasefire. <laughs> it was, you know, well, anyways. Um, just an important person, um, the, the only uh, Palestinian uh, skipper in the fishing fleet, Madeleine Kolab, and her two sons. Her father got crippled up, and she, uh, the son was too young to take over, so she stepped into her father's shoes and, uh, and took over the fishing. And that's just a pretty picture of her. She, uh, she's smirking because I just, I just told her that my father was a commercial fisherman and used the same net needle to make, to make nets as she was doing. She thought that was... A good joke. Um, again, just pictures of Palestinians uh, at the beach. This is uh, just a short ways away from Wadi Gaza, the, uh, the, old, the main river in Gaza, but basically it's a sewer outlet. Uh, pour, pours 90 million, 90 million liters a day of sewage into the Mediterranean because they, they their sewer plants are destroyed. They won't let the chemicals in to make them run. They won't let the parts in. So I was within I was within sight of this river. Um, just it was just uh, just basically just barely out of the screen here around the corner. But because the general flow of the of the ocean went to the north, they said it, this was a clean beach. But um, I wouldn't swim in it. <laughs> but the Palestinians do. So what's next here? Just Palestinians. Um, joy of life. I, uh, hard to believe, but uh, smiling and, and enjoying life. Um, but in the same breath, they're, they're tough customers. I mean, this guy's tough as nails. Um, he's seen a lot. I mean, you just look at his face. He's seen a lot. Uh, what, other, what else do they do? Uh, karate classes, um, mixed men and women. These folks are being actually being trained by a, a Syrian Palestinian who, who escaped Syria because of the war got to Egypt and he was welcomed into Gaza. So talk about turning the tables. He, uh, he escaped uh, a nightmare in Syria and the Gazan people uh, invited him to come to Gaza. So he's, the, uh, he's actually now this young fellow, uh, Mohammed is the, uh, the karate champion of Gaza, <laughs> trained in Syria. Uh, they play soccer, they cheer for the home team just like me and you. Um, like again, trying to make the best of a, of a tough situation. Uh, these, these are the uh, Gaza's poor, the refugee camps are poor, and these are the poorest of the poor refugee camps. This is Mag, Mag Magzir? Magazi. Mag Magazi, thank you. Um, I went to an iftar dinner, uh, I was there during Ramadan. So these are the, uh, the kids from, from the refugee camp. Um, wonderful kids. Uh, and that's a, a Czechoslovakian ISM volunteer in the middle there. Take note of the, of the young boy uh, near the top there. You see he's, he's blind in one eye. I saw that repeatedly all over Gaza, um, over and over again. Children uh, blind, um, one eye or completely blind. Um, oh, like I don't know why, but it's just something I saw. Um, either nutrition or uh, wartime injuries or illness, I don't know. Uh, and hearing aids, hearing aids, over and over and over again. Everybody wearing hearing aids, little kids wearing hearing aids. And I'm told it's because of the war, because of the, uh, the Israelis would fly the F-18s over, or 16s, whatever they are, over Gaza City and break the sound barrier just to, I, I, I was there and I heard it. It terrorizes you to have a sound you know, barrier explosion right over your heads. So uh, not many toys and lots of kids, so uh, everything gets shared. <laughs> But, but they're happy playing, and uh, like I say, they um, made me sad, but they're happy. Like I say, just uh, half of Gaza is under 18 years of age. So um, it's a very young, 
young group of people. So Gaza City, the, the government built these homemade, uh, they had a Ferris wheel as well, so they'd move these things from neighborhood to neighborhood around Gaza City for the kids just to entertain themselves in the street. Again, if you take note of the, of the young girl on the left in the, um, in the swing, she's blind in one eye. Um, again, like I say, I, just to show you, and I saw that over and over again. Um, sad. So, um, this is in a, um, in a special uh, daycare for war traumatized children in, in Bet Hanun. And uh, everybody had been doing uh, paintings, uh, drawings, uh, fill in the blanks kinds of drawings. And they're all very proud of their work and very, very happy. And then they gave the kids a big sheet of uh, uh, cloth there and they gave them paints. And they now they said, there's no lines to fill in. They said, just paint whatever you want. Just paint. Paint whatever you feel like. What, paint your life. Paint what's going on in your world. And these guys got busy and they painted and painted and they're laughing and joking. And what are they painting? They're painting tanks. Rockets. You can see the, um, the three round, big round people in the middle. They're, that's, they're, those are soldiers because they're big and fat and round because they're all padded. Israeli soldiers with guns in their hands. There's tanks there, there's ambulances, um, rockets, rocket launchers. The little crosses, th those are drones. I didn't know what they were until somebody actually had to explain it to me. Those are drones in the air and probably planes, I guess. But um, And if you look up in the upper left there, you see two little houses with stick people in them. Those stick people are, are spewing blood. And this is what these kids are painting. They're, you know, this, this is just their life. It's, this is nothing to them. They, you know... They ask them to paint what's, what's, what their life is about, and this is what they paint. Now there's, again, a little house with stick people spewing blood. But, you know, they're smiling, they're, they're proud, they're painting their flag, they're, they're resisting, they're, they're not going to give up. <laughs> they're uh, very, very, I mean, I, mean I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from these folks. So, and one point I want to make is that the... Uh, the Palestinians of Gaza want to make sure that everybody understands that they're Palestinians so, over and over again. And this is the plan. They're trying to say, oh, those are Gazans. Palestinians are in the West Bank. These are Gazans. They're not Gazans. They're Palestinians. And over and over again, it was, and I'd make the mistake of saying Gazans. And I'd be correct as, no, it, we're Palestinians who live in Gaza. And they're very proud of the fact that there's 7 million Palestinians all over the world, um, you know, diaspora and uh, you know Syria, West Bank, Jerusalem, Gaza, and they're not going to give up. I met communists. I met deeply, deeply religious people, um, uh, Christians. Um, uh, you know, every, 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 you know, Fatah, uh, Hamas, uh, Islamic Jihad. Um, I met fighters. So I, I met all sorts of people from right across the um, spectrum in Gaza, the Palestinians. And you know, a lot of people were angry with Hamas, and they were going to vote independent. They were going to vote Fatah. They were going to do this. They were going to do that. But when it came to the resistance, they were solid. There was 100%. They, they're all for resisting. No one's giving up. No one's conceding anything. Um, well, anyways, that's, that's, that's what I heard and saw firsthand from these folks. And that's it. Just a quick one. Uh, Eva's got much more to show, and you really should be seeing Eva's show and not mine. And I can answer some questions.